Hi everybody, my name is Dr. Tamara Russell and I'm here with my good friend and colleague, Karen Fraser Colby DeMattis. Karen is what I call a super educator and you're gonna hear about all the great things that she's been doing in a second. But we're here together now because we're about to offer some special mindfulness training for educators. And we really recognize and honor the work of educators over the pandemic, before as well, of course, but especially over the pandemic, we really recognize how these professionals have dug deep again and again and again, and it's still not over. So we're extremely passionate about bringing the right kinds of tools and techniques to help educators care for themselves, first and foremost, but through that process, be more available to offer what our young people need and, and give them the education that really matters. So Karen, do you want to introduce yourself and say hi and tell us a bit about your experience? Sure. I've been in education now for, for oh, over 35 years and uh, have worked with uh, children from three to college level and uh, in very, very different settings in, in the US, in Brazil, uh, in international schools, in public schools and private schools, um, as a consultant as well, working in, um, in different capacities. But what I see the most is this passion and this need for, um, acknowledging what's going on and how these educators are reinventing themselves and how this year and a half has been so challenging and has really, really um, brought us some, some ideas on how to uh, use what we know uh, so that the well-being not only of our students but our own well-being is being care is being taken care of so in 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 looking at the connections and in looking at our development of awareness and and the different contexts and as you know tam i i work in pluricultural uh contexts so different people come with different experiences and, and different realities. And it, it's really important for us to be aware of that. And one of the most amazing things I think um, that your framework brings is the possibility of really tailoring this framework to the context in which we're in. And that's what I've been doing for the for the past 10 years, right? Depending on the context that I'm in, we started, we first started before your book, we started with small workshops, but then after after your book with some PLCs, with some book clubs and, and really thinking and reflecting and studying the book and then putting it into practice and and really working with uh, what we call ethnographic research, right? And school-based research. So it's about the group you're working with and who you are in touch with and, and what your ethos is and, and the culture in which you're uh, working from that, and even the school culture, right? Uh, all the, the differences that come across in um, our way and, and, and the power um, of being aware <laughs> of what is going on and, and trying to make a difference as, as, as we go in all in, in the different directions, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And this, for me, this was the challenge around cultural sensitivity of mindfulness, you know, bringing something that fundamentally had been developed in the UK and predominantly in the healthcare system a, bringing it to Brazil, B, bringing it to the school setting, C, bringing it to a variety of different schools. And I mean, I just, like you, I, I went back to my notes and I, I looked through the, the slides and the decks and the workbooks that we'd made. Um, initially, just unpacking that definition 
of John Kabat-Zinn. So, you know, what is mindfulness? How do you explain it to a, you know, a willing professional who may not have had any practice? How do you help them to make sense of this understanding? So the definition for those that don't know is mindfulness is defined as a type of awareness that arises on paying attention on purpose, moment by moment and without judgment. And so the, the, the book that, that Karen's referring to is, is really a book that unpacks <laughs> those, those elements, those cognitive elements of, of the mindfulness definition, looking through the lens of neuroscience, looking through the lens of martial arts and clinical psychology. Um, but initially it was just playing with those those themes, wasn't it? So do you want to share a bit what you can remember from those days, maybe more than I can? We, we started off always um, looking at intention, right? Intention was, was a big deal. The intention to pay attention. But you also brought, and, and Shapiro talks about that, right? In terms of attention, intention, and attitude. And I think you bring in, in this attitude, the curiosity, the courage, and the compassion, right? But with all of this, Tam, I think that what we've been working a lot on is, is the ethics of what we're doing and who are we working with and listening, listening mostly to what is really going on so that we can actually tailor and, and it's it's not about creating a course and then delivering the course but it's about having of course your plan but allowing the experiences of people who are with you emerge and learn with and from the group you're with within the framework. So uh, thinking of the pause and thinking of your intentions, thinking of your attention, thinking about the habits of mind and the way you like to, to say it, becoming a PhD on yourself, right? And, and compassion, that's really, I wouldn't call it a theme, but compassion is really what goes through the whole, the whole idea and the whole framework with curiosity and with courage, the courage to see what's there. I think that's and basically what we've been doing, right? Yeah. <laughs> and can you share a little bit? Because I mean, people are often, they often ask, you know, what really works? And I suppose that's why I like to work with experts by experience in their own fields. I'm an educator of sorts, I guess. Most of my education, for sort of formal educating work is, is in higher education rather than with youngsters. And of course I'm a mindfulness teacher educator, but I don't have 30 years of experience being in and around schools and teachers and administrators and the business end of a school, the management layer of a school. I mean, can you share a little bit about, you know, highlights and lowlights maybe? And, and most of this experience to, to share with the viewer is, is in Brazil, but a lot of it was within international and baccalaureate schools. So there's a, a very global flavor when you're in those schools, but also some schools that are in the Brazilian public system, which are, you know, a very, it's a very particular kind of environment with youngsters with some quite, you know, particular kinds of needs and living in, in social realities that, you know, luckily we don't quite have it like that in the UK, but we're not far off probably some of the, the youngsters that teachers in the UK may be connecting to in terms of their home environments and, and the struggles that they're having at home. So any insights there that, that you could share? I think, Tam, that um, one of the most important aspects that, that I learned in taking mindfulness to schools is doing it mindfully. And by, by saying that, I mean, not top down. And, and as you know, I think more than 25 years of 
my experience has been in leadership positions and senior leadership positions as director and principal, director of teaching and learning and whatnot. So the, I think that the beauty of it is the co-construction of a mindful culture within the school. And a lot of times what happens is um, the setting doesn't allow us to be that way. And, and I am, I'm thinking of one particular school in which uh, the, <laughs> the yearbook picture was a pause because we had worked all year with mindfulness and it and it just touched those students and those seniors in such a way that the yearbook became uh, a metaphor to all of that. But we had to really work with uh, the administrative team and, and parents and the whole community. So it's not only about working with the student if we're not working with all stakeholders. And if we don't have a shared vision, because it becomes harder if you're doing it on your own. But sometimes, sometimes that one teacher that does it on his or her own is a doorway into a possible transformation of culture. Yeah, so there isn't, there's no recipe. There's no recipe. I think that the, if there is something, Paulo Freire would say, you don't just transpose, but you transform. And for you to be able to transform, you need to really understand where you are and who the people are and how do you co-construct things um, in a way that they are sustainable, right? And that, that was always my fear. If I left, would it go away? Right. So how do you make it sustainable so that it stays, the work stays, right? Yeah, and maybe it's also something about not being too wedded to what the work is or how it landed or where it landed. And I suppose that's always been my interest is, you know, kind of resisting a protocol in many ways. <laughs> um, some of that was a bit indulgent. I now can reflect on that. But... The, the, at the heart of it was, I think, a piece around understanding that it can't be one size fits all. There's no way that that can work. And experiences of working in, in Brazil and the UK was really my training ground in that, you know, how, how do we make this work? You know, Tiago Tatton's work there is postdoctoral work on, on, on the same uh, book kind of program slightly different version of it how do we offer this in a hospital in you know, the south of brazil public hospital where the environment is so very different and actually even the teacher community is very different um whether it's educationalists or mindfulness teachers they've got a very different set of training they've got a very different educational stance and orientation and we must be contextualizing this otherwise it just doesn't it just doesn't make sense. But there's also something about, you use the language of seeds, which I loved. And I, I met recently um, a, young, a young man, an adult now, who did this um, body and mind training program, which is in the book, Mindfulness in Motion, uh, as part of Fight for Change, a boxing charity that I've been involved in for many years. And he was about 15 or so when he was at the gym and we ran a really small pilot. It was a MPhil project for a student at the Institute of Psychiatry, really tiny cohort, mostly young men that were at the boxing gym, totally adapted. I mean, you know, totally adapted, just skating through the themes, uh, using the boxing, but trying to hold the structure as we went through. And I came across him again. I can't, I think we've connected on Facebook. I recognized his name. He's been sort of fringe involved with the charity over the years, but he finished university. He now works for the council as a architectural consultant, a town planning. He's done really, really brilliantly. And what he said was, I didn't really get it at the time, but I remembered it when I was at university and I was struggling. 
and you know at the time it was kind of a bit weird and I sort of you know I just went <laughs> along with it because some of the other guys were doing it and you know coach told me to do it <laughs> you know coach <laughs> told me to do it um so you know you just never know what lands and he said it was that seed that allowed me to revisit that and then I got the app and then I was you know got a book and and I used mindfulness to help me get through some tough times at university and I mean I love this kind of story and I think it is playing out all over the world with just dedicated teachers and practitioners who make a difference by their very presence not necessarily even by what's being taught but there's something that lands and very difficult to to get kind of formal outcomes which is what a school often wants what a you know here in the UK we have Ofsted you know Ofsted wants <laughs> scores and outcomes and these are necessary and good I'm not totally dismissive of them but often the richness of what's really been impactful is not captured by that and maybe you'd like to just comment on I, I think that um Maya Angelou says that in such a beautiful way when she says that students may not remember the content but they'll remember how they felt and so it's how you're teaching and what you bring and how you embody what you believe in is what makes a difference. The other day I was talking to a dear friend of mine and uh, she was saying that she met a former student. She was a biology teacher and she did a lot of visualization and relaxation. And that when she met the student, you know, after an adult or whatever, that's what he remembered. He didn't remember the names of the cells or, you know, the, uh, all the, the bones and whatever but he remembered this essence of how she was present and how she made him feel and the space that was given for him to become the best version of himself. Um, so I think that all these experiences are extremely important and to also think of what is culturally relevant as well. So when I um, took this work to a public school system here and I was dealing with students who were finishing, right? They were in their last year of high school. And, um, and so we, we, we did this and, and I remember the principal saying, Karen, before you work with the students, do you wanna work with the teachers? And I said, yes, please. <laughs> so we did that first and then we worked with the students. And, they brought so much. And so when you go into this work uh, with an open heart, there's so much learning because um, you learn with and from each other in the group, you know, from different perspectives and, and it kind of opens up your view of the world um, because of the different, because of the differences, right, in perspectives. So, um, that that is that is absolutely beautiful and and uh, one of the reasons why I love education is that you never stop learning. <laughs> you, you're always learning. <laughs> well, and just maybe to finish off, I mean, one of the I guess one of the the joys for me, and particularly having been developing this teacher training in in Brazil for so long with. I must mention, of course, my, my colleagues, Tiago Tatten and, and Clarissa and Mateus from Casa de Auto, long time collaborators. And one of the things that they that comes out with this training is that we seem to be able to um, develop mindfulness teachers who can be themselves. So by having this framework, but also the allowing, I mean, it's a mess from a research perspective. <laughs> It's a total mess um, because everybody's bringing their own unique flavor to it. But our thrust and our real strong orientation is around the embodiment of mindfulness. And this fundamentally for me is about how to bring your best self. You are part of that ecosystem and eco culture as a teacher. And for me, I want teachers that bring as much of themselves as possible 
whether it's contextual experience like education or some of the other beautiful, unique features that might come from, from somebody with as much depth as you in, in the teaching environment. So share a little bit about, you know, some of the extras that you bring um, to your teaching, which I think are just fantastic. And it means, you know, your course is not gonna be the same as, as another course because it's you and you're there and you know, you're know you bringing your awesomeness and all of your skills to the table. So share a little bit and give a tidbit just for anybody that might be thinking about signing up for the, the Mindfulness in Motion for educators um, online trainings that you're offering because it is gonna be unique. There, I'm not sure there's really anybody else offering um, what you're bringing. So there is mindfulness, there is movement, there is neuroscience, but Go ahead. Well, I think that when we were designing the program, we we had educators in mind and educators from all walks of life, right? The experience, the beginners, uh, whatever it is that if you teach mindfulness or if you teach uh, movement or if you teach biology or math or language or whatever it is, um, and whatever age group you work with, if you teach at the college level, if you're a professor, um, but you come into this environment um, wanting to learn and, and establish this contact and this connection that goes beyond uh, any school walls. Right? I think that um, I have a background, my first master's is in creative arts and learning. So I have a background, I'm a trained uh, actress and, and creative movement. I started dancing when I was two <laughs> and was part of a, of a group. And uh, then I went into education with my full heart and, uh, and, and then went into more of a pluricultural environment and bilingual education and that kind of curriculum development. Um, but I'm also <laughs> a, a flower essence practitioner. And, um, and I bring that with a lot of the healing uh, aspect of the soul. And, and my heart is open, I think, to to whatever is there, <laughs> right? Uh, and I think that, that that is unique in, in, in the sense that a lot of the mindfulness practices also have some kind of connection with uh, voice training that I've done, with, uh, with act, becoming an actor as well and those skills that you develop because of the presence, because of the breath, because of the breathing, because of the body. Um, so I think that, that th those are a few things that we will bring, but also the space for the group to bring their uniqueness, right? And so I think that no one course is the same ever, ever, even if you're following the same book <laughs> every time a different group comes together it's a different system that comes together a different dynamics that is that that is established and so it's it's unique in that sense well and and partly again i think because this work was developed in in brazil there's a real openness for those on these courses to appreciate the breadth of the biopsychosocial spiritual model yes. and we it is a course that is based on science um, and based particularly on understanding of the brain and what the brain needs to do um, what the body needs to do to promote states of mindfulness but but we have a real openness to bigger and broader questions and and I do personally believe that to be more important now than ever I mean, the research is also clear that those that have a more transpersonal lens on things tend to be more resilient across a, a variety of metrics. So, you know, the science is clear that if we can open that layer, not, you know, it's not to be preachy, it's not to be converting people, but it's just to say, how does this come 
for you in your life and I guess you're modeling there as a teacher the use of of the flower essences as as part of a way to connect through the natural environment and through nature to to something that may be bigger than us little puny people <laughs> as human beings our little bodies on this big massive planet and and within a huge cosmos um, but I also must say, I mean, my own my own personal experience using uh, using rosemary to help focus attention. Uh, my attention system is a little bit scattered at times, and I really found rosemary was a top tip um, that I now share with all of my clients. I do a lot of work with ADHD um, adults and uh, some youngsters, but mainly adults. And using the rosemary to just it just does this. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> and many of the viewers may be familiar with with lavender to to sleep, but don't give away all the secrets, Karen. But Karen has introduced <laughs> to, to many other essences, and um, this is something to explore. This is one of our senses, and and you know, and noticing what is the impact on the body. And it's not for Karen to tell you that it will or it won't do a certain thing. It's for us to get that 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 science bug <laughs> and become our own scientist and you know offer some experiments that we could we could explore so that's something particularly unique for those of you that that like to explore in that way and for some people particularly smell is a great way to to help us regulate not only our emotions but also our attention and both of those need help right now that's for sure <laughs> attention and emotion Woo! a little bit all over the place, all over the place. So I, I, one, one, of the, one of the things, Tam, that um, that I really, really love about the work is that you know that you have to practice and practice and practice, but ultimately, you you find your own way. Yeah. Yes. So it, it's the possibility of of being in touch with different practices and then choosing what's best for you and choosing your path, your journey. So self-empowerment, yeah, really key yeah. In, that. <laughs> in that. All right, well, listen, thank you so much. Right? <laughs> Once you see you things, you can't unsee them, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't tell that. That's a, the double-edged sword of mindfulness, as we sometimes refer to it. But um, yeah, seeing clearly is is step one, isn't it? And you're right. Sometimes what we see is is difficult and painful, and many. Well, the whole system is in that right now, isn't it? What we really need to look at is is very painful, but the mindfulness and the compassion, I think, is our our go-to um, to, to get that work done. So thank you so much and uh, we'll pause now. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say that this mindfulness is heartfulness all the way. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs>